Good day to you all. Oh, Dr. W uh, Dr. Allen, um, one second. I'll give the administrative introduction to the panelists here in a second as they file in for us. And uh, I'll turn things over to you in a moment, Dr. Allen. I apologize. Right. Oh, for DOQ. Excellent, excellent. All right. I wanted to spend a moment here to, before Dr. Allen begins to welcome everyone to the latest installment of our AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club is on the Association of Antiviral Prophylaxis and Rituximab Use with PTLD, and it's hosted by the AST Infectious Disease Community of Practice. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Volte from Bern University Hospital in Switzerland, and our moderator today is Dr. Upton Allen from SickKids University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. But before we begin uh, the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. There's currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we have the remaining, while we finish the remaining announcements. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available on the MyAST website within 24 to 48 hours after the session. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard uh, for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the journal club, we encourage you to participate using the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the Journal Club. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's Journal Club, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Upton Allen, to begin our presentation. Hello, good day to you all. I'm Dr. Upton Allen. I'm at the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto in Canada. Today, our presenter is Dr. Laura Valti, and Dr. Valti received her medical training in Switzerland and subsequently was certified in general internal medicine and infectious diseases. She also has received a certificate of advanced studies in clinical research from the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine at the University of Bern. She's currently a consultant in the Department of Infectious Diseases at Bern University Hospital. Dr. Walti, welcome. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen, for the introduction and welcome to everyone. I would like to thank the organizer and the AST Infectious Disease Community of Practice for the invitation to this journal club. It's an honor and my great pleasure to present you our study on the, on the association of antiviral prophylaxis and rituximab use with post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, PTLD, inside the Swiss transplant cohort study, STCS. I have no disclosures. This project was funded by a grant from the STCS. I would like to give you, to start with an introduction on PTLD and associated risk factors to give you some background why we were interested to study the effects of antiviral prophylaxis, androtuximab and PTLD. To start, as you all know, PTLD is a devastating complication directly associated with transplantation. As shown, here, as shown here on the left side in an early publication for renal transplant recipients, where a much higher incidence for lymphoma after solid organ transplantation than expected was found. PTLD incidence ranges between 1 to 20% of recipients. A biphasic pattern has been described as shown in this publication in French renal transplant recipients on your right with the highest incidence in the first year after transplantation. Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, represented by the green dot in this picture, is known to play a major role in PTLD development. More than 70% of cases are EBV associated. Primary infection leads to latency of EBV in B cells. These latently infected B cells have immortal properties and their expansion is usually con controlled by our immune system, here schematically shown as the blue T, including EBV-specific T cells. In the context of insuffic insufficient control, as seen in the not-so-blue so, bright, not so blue T, 
EBV latency can induce expansion of these B cells, which leads to replication of EBV and if not controlled to stepwise lymphoproliferation. B cell expansion can lead to the development of polyclonal lymphoid aggregates known as early lesions. And if this process is ongoing, the proliferating lymphoid tissue can acquire somatic mutations and undergo polyclonal and in the worst case monoclonal expansion of blastoid lymphocytes known as monomorphic PTLD, what is then subclassified according to general lymphoma criteria. EBV negative PTLD, not shown in this slide, is characterized by genetic aberration, aberrations found in EBV negative lymphoma arising in the general population. Incidence of PTLD depends on recipient's age of transplantation. The highest incidence is found in children. Allograft type, the highest incidence is found in lung and heart lung recipients, as seen in the graph on the left side, comparing cumulative incidence of PTLD over time according to organ transplant. It depends on induction treatment and intensity of immunosuppressive therapy and EBV serostatus of donor D and recipient R. D plus or minus serostatus status also referred as EBV high risk serostatus. The importance of these individual risk factors differ according to time of PTLD occurrence after transplantation. Usually PTLD occurring in the first year is referred as early PTLD. The most important risk factors, risk factor for EBV positive PTLD, especially early after transplantation is, the, is this high risk EBV serostatus respectively associated primary EBV infection post-transplant. As shown in this figure for kidney transplant recipients on the left side, comparing PTLD incidence according to EBV serostatus of donor and recipient. Since these high-risk recipients have been identified, many attempts have been taken to reduce EBV replication and PTLD subsequently in this population including preemptive approaches such as serial EBV viral load measurements and reduction of immunosuppression in case of increasing EBV DNAmia, as well as the administration of the monoclonal anti-CD20 antibody rituximab in case redu reduction of immunosuppression is not enough for control. Although high EBV DNAmia is a risk factor for PTLD, Time points for monitoring, source samples, and cutoff values for intervention are not standardized in this population. This brings us to our research question. We are asking what preventive measures could have an impact on PTLD occurrence. The first measure we were interested in is antiviral prophylaxis. Antiviral prophyla prophylaxis, namely antiherpes prophylaxis, is usually given to prevent cytomegalovirus, CMV, and HSV herpes simplex virus reactivation, namely acyclovir and gencyclovir and its oral forms. They have inhibitory effect on lytic EBV replication and viral shedding. Nevertheless, the role of these antiviral prophylaxis in prevention of EBV-associated PTLD is controversial. Several reports early after the introduction of universal antiviral prophylaxis have supported in high-risk patients have supported its effects, as seen here exemplarily in the left graph from a case control study, including renal transplant recipients with a higher effect for gencyclovir, the brighter line, than acyclovir. More recent data did not show an, an effect of antiherpes prophylaxis on PTLD incidence. In fact, in the recent meta-analysis I show you here, there is no, no reduction in the rate of EBV-associated PTLD in recipients receiving antiviral prophylaxis was reported. This is the diamond on the top. Or for CMV, the diamond in the middle, or HSV active agents, this is the diamond at the bottom. However, only three of the nine studies showed here included the adult patient and liver transplant recipients were predominant, what makes generalizability, at least for the adult population, uncertain. The second measure that caught our attention was rituximab. As we have seen, rituximab is used in the treatment of 
EBV replication or diagnose CD20 positive PTLD that did not respond to reduction of immunosuppression alone. Reducing CD20 positive cells seems to reduce EBV replication and CD20 cell expansion. So the question is if this measure has preventive properties when given already before EBV replication. In solid organ transplant recipients, rituximab is given regularly together with other measures as part of the desensitization strategy for ABO incompatible kidney transplantation, as you can see schematically at the top left, where it's used to reduce B cells and associated blood group antibody production. And it has been successfully and safely used as sole induction therapy in a randomized study in kidney transplant recipients. In this study shown on the bottom left, including 280 renal transplant recipients, malign malignancy rates were similar, but PTLD was not specifically reported. Interestingly, in the hematologic stem cell transplant, HSCT setting, where the PTLD incidence is much higher, the use of rituximab to prevent PTLD has become an initial preemptive intervention in the context of EBV replication. Moreover, rituximab used prophylactic pre-transplant was associated with a reduction in EBV replication in high-risk HSCT recipients when compared to controls that did, not that did not receive rituximab in an observational study, as shown on the right side in panel A where the dotted line are HSCT recipients receiving rituximab. Remarkably, no single case of EBV PTLD was found in these high-risk patients in the first three years after transplantation, as shown in panel B for the patients that received rituximab. Sorry. The aim of this nationwide cohort study was to describe the clinical characteristics of PTLD cases after solid organ transplantation and to assess the effect of rituximab induction and the use of antiviral prophylaxis on PTLD occurrence. We performed a nested project in the nationwide observational Swiss transplant cohort study. All six Swiss transplant centers did participate. The STCS and the current subproject were approved by the local ethics committees. During the study period, more than 90% of transplant recipients in Switzerland consented to be included in the STCS. Briefly, in the STCS, patient data is prospectively collected and for our project data was extracted from the STCS database. Additional data on PTLD, including localization, classification and management not captured in the STCS database was, re was retrieved through a standardized data collection sheet. We included the first transplantation in the STCS in patients enrolled from May 2008 to June 2019. Because of the structure of our data, as you will see, we had to use different statistical approaches to answer the two research questions. To analyze the impact of antiviral prophylaxis on EBV positive PTLD incidence, we used adjusted competing risk regression models. Patients were censored at PTLD occurrence, graft loss, or death. We stratified for early and late PTLD since risk factor differ in literature and universal prophylaxis is given usually directly after transplantation, and treatment effects might differ for the two time periods. For this analysis, we excluded EBV negative PTLD since we do not expect an effect of antivirals on EBV PTLD, on non EBV PTLD, sorry. Since no single case of PTLD was found in the patients receiving rituximab induction, competing risk regression models could not be used due to the violation of the proportional hazard assumption. We analyzed the impact of rituximab induction therapy using adjusted restricted mean survival time analysis. Since probably not everyone is yet familiar with RMST, I think it's worth to explain it here. Restricted mean survival time analysis is a well-established measure. It compares differences in areas under Kaplan-Meier curves of two groups. In contrast to proportional hazard models, where the treatment effect has to show proportionality, meaning the effect has to go in the same direct direction for the entire period, 
treatment effects in RMST do not need to have this property. This is especially useful for interventions where the intervention is associated with a higher early mortality and benefits from the intervention is only seen after a certain follow-up time, such as cancer surgery. The result, as you can see in the table, is given as restricted mean survival time for a defined time span, in this example, 10 years, for the two groups, as well as the difference of RMST shown in bold with its, con sorry, here for the two groups, as well as the difference of RMST shown in bold with its confidence interval. As you can see, the confidence interval does not cross zero and is therefore considered statistical significant. These values can also be plotted over time as seen in the graph on the right for RMST in the two groups, as well as, well as the difference with this confidence interval on the very left side. I took this example comparing two groups of cancer patients from Paul Lambert, a professor of biostatistics, where he explains the practical use of RMST. To say it in a sentence, the restricted mean survival time quantifies the loss in life expectancy over a time period, in this example, 10 years after an intervention, when comparing participants with and without the intervention. This brings us finally to the results. We included 4,765 solid organ transplant recipients with a total follow-up of more than 23,000 patient years or person years. Median age was 54, and only around 5% of recipients were minors. EBV high-risk serostatus was present in 6%. More than half of recipients were renal transplant recipients marked in navy in the pie graph, followed by liver recipients in red, and lung recipients in yellow. Over the study period, we identified, we identified 57 cases of histopathological diagnosed PTLD. Incidence was around 2.4 cases per thousand person years. As you would probably expect, the highest incidence was found in lung transplant recipients, the lowest in kidney transplant recipients as shown in the the graph on the left, comparing incidence rate according to organ transplanted. More than 60% of PTLD were diagnosed already at the stage of monomorphic PTLD, shown in petrol on the right side. Among 57 cases of PTLD, 68% were EBV positive PTLD. This table compares selected characteristics of recipients with EBV positive and EBV negative PTLD. Solid organ transplant recipients with EBV positive PTLD were younger compared to patients with EBV negative PTLD, and median time to PTLD was shorter for the EBV positive group. EBV high risk serostatus was more frequent in EBV positive PTLD, it was not present in. EBV negative PTLD, and more than a quarter of EBV positive PTLD was found in lung transplant recipients. As shown in the graph on the right side, the incidence of EBV positive PTLD, marked in red, was highest in the first year post transplant and decreased thereafter, but was not the case for EBV negative PTLD cases in blue, where you could imagine an increase over time. This distinct temporal occurrence of EBV positive and negative PTLD potentially reflects the differences, the difference of these two malignancies and may contribute to the biphasic pattern of PTLD, PTLD occurrence that we have seen before. Extranodal involvement, defined as extranodal involvement with or without nodal involvement, was very frequent in both groups and occurred in about 80% of patients. Central nervous system involvement, CNS, was exclusively found in EBV PTLD. PTLD lesions involving the transplanted organ were detected in one third of patients with external involvement, as seen in the last column. It was mainly found in lung and livers, and around 80% of these cases were EBV positive PTLD. Very briefly, treatment and outcome. 
reducing immunosuppression alone was the treatment for 18% of EBV positive PTLD, while none of the EBV negative PTLD cases was treated with this strategy. 44% of patients diagnosed with PTLD died during follow-up, as shown in the black boxes for EBV positive and EBV negative PTLD, with most deaths attributed to PTLD, around 64%, as shown in gray. No difference was found for the two groups, or time to death was also similar in both groups. This table compares selected characteristics of recipients with and without antiviral prophylaxis. A more comprehensive list of characteristics can be found in table A of the appendix. Antiviral prophylaxis was defined as the start of an antiherpes antiviral in the first two weeks after transplantation. Overall, 45% of patients received antiviral prophylaxis with gangcyclovir, around 90%, or with acyclovir or its oral forms for a median duration of 97 days. The rate of recipients receiving antiviral prophylaxis was dependent on the type of transplant, as shown in the pie graphs for recipients receiving prophylaxis on the left side and recipients not receiving prophylaxis on the right. Lung transplant recipients in yellow received in 94% of cases antiviral prophylaxis and contributed almost 20% of recipients to the group that received antiviral prophylaxis. While EBV serostatus was similar in both groups, around 5 and 6%, CMV high risk <coughs> sorry, serostatus was, as expected, more frequent in the antiviral prophylaxis group. And recipients with antiviral prophylaxis were more likely to have received hemoglobulins, ATG, as marked here, as part of their induction treatment. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. These higher rates of non-risk factors associated with PTLD in the group that received antiviral prophylaxis led presumably to a higher crude probability of EBV positive PTLD in recipients with antiviral prophylaxis as shown here with the dashed line over time. In the adjusted competing risk regression model, deaths and graft loss were considered competing risk. We adjusted and we adjusted for sex, age, EBV serostatus, induction therapy, and organ transplant. We did not find an effect of antiviral prophylaxis on EBV PTLD incidences in the first year post transplant on the left side or beyond this period on the right side, as seen in the two blue boxes. The results remained unchanged when comparing. Well, or Wellgang cyclovir, which is believed to be more active against EBV than well acyclovir, versus no antiviral prophylaxis. This is not shown here. Similar to previous reports, we identified different risk factors associated with early and late EBV positive, P EBV positive PTLD. In our analysis, early EBV positive PTLD on the left side was associated with EBV high risk serostate serostatus with a subdistribution hazard ratio of 18.5 and lung transplantation with a subdistribution hazard ratio of 5.9. Occurrence of late EBV, late EBV positive PTLD was associated with young age at transplantation. However, we think that this rather reflects an immortal person time bias than a real finding, since we have a mixed cohort of children and adults. In cohorts with an exclusively adult population, higher age is usually associated with the occurrence of late PTLD. This table compares selected characteristics of recipients with and without rituximab induction. Rituximab induction was defined as rituximab as part of the induction treatment and was found in 191 patients. These patients were younger, but EBV serostatus distribution was similar when compared to recipients not receiving rituximab induction. The vast majority of recipients receiving rituximab as induction treatment were renal transplant recipients in NAVI, as you can see in NAVI, in both pie graphs. 88% of these renal transplant recipients that received 
received rituximab as part of their induction therapy for ABO incompatible renal transplantation as highlighted by the red line. None of the 191 patients receiving rituximab as part of the induction treatment, the dashed line developed PTLD as you can see in this graph. In the adjusted restricted mean survival time model, adjusted for age type of transplantation, use of ADG and EBV serostatus, the mean PTLD for free survival time at nine years of follow-up was significantly shorter, 0.104 years, for recipients not receiving rituximab, meaning that the average loss of PTLD free survival time at nine years was 0.104 104 years for a patient not receiving rituximab. This difference might appear small to you, but the rarity of events and the large cohort of more than 4,500 recipients have to be taken into account when interpreting the data. Since the vast majority were renal transplant recipients, to, and to exclude that the effect of rituximab is caused by confounding due to a comparison of different incidences in two groups, we performed a subgroup analysis restricted to renal transplant recipients at the bottom, where we saw the same effect, but with a but smaller due to the lower incidence of PTLD in this group. Our study, of course, has several limitations. First, the relatively small number of PTLD cases cases potentially affects the power to identify other factors associated with increased or reduced risk for development of PTLD. Our findings regarding the effect of rituximab on PTLD occurrence are based on an observational study design. Therefore, we cannot completely exclude that this association is caused by confounding factors. However, we try to address this by adjusting our multivariate model for confounding factors associated with PTLD. Since the vast majority of recipients receiving rituximab were renal transplant recipients, you could argue that this effect is only seen in renal transplant recipients. Nevertheless, a difference by organ transplant in this low risk population seems biologically not very plausible. So to conclude and to open then the discussion, External involvement was frequent and involved in one third the transplanted organ, mainly lung and liver. Nodal involvement was only found in one third of cases, but this has implications when screening clinically for PTLD in solid organ transplant recipients. When correcting for known risk factors, EBV positive PTLD incidence rates were similar with or without antiviral prophylaxis. This is in line with the findings of the most recent meta-analysis. The explanation for this could be that EBV active antivirals need to be activated, activated by phosphorylation by a viral timidine kinase. But EBV transformed B cells, as we have seen, are latently infected and do therefore not express EBV timidine kinase proteins and are therefore potentially not active on EBV-driven cell proliferation. In our cohort, rituximab given as part of the induction regimen was associated with a reduced risk for PTLD. This has, to our knowledge, knowledge not been shown before in this population. Our findings match the findings in, in HSCT, where the PTLD risk is much higher. In our study, we did not address the potentially negative impact of rituximab induction. And therefore, we cannot provide an elaborated risk-benefit analysis of rituximab induction. And side effects, as you know, associated with rituximab include an increased risk for infection. In our study, when we looked in the table added, in the two groups, infections rates were similar. These are shown in appendix in table B. What is in line with the prospective randomized study that that used rituximab as induction agent in renal transplant recipients, where the overall incidence of infections during the first year was not higher after treatment with rituximab compared to placebo in the first year after transplantation. 
With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and especially acknowledge Cedric Hirzel from my institution with whom I have done this work. I thank all our collaborators and their institutions, the STCS as well as the STCS participants for their willingness to participate. I am happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Let me um, start with the first question. Uh, can you just um, uh, clarify for me uh, if there was any difference in uh, survival based on uh, EBV positive versus uh, EBV negative PTLD? Um, yes, I can go to this. <laughs> it's very small. Um, the, the other, sur sorry, survival was was say um, was very similar for both group. It was about um, six to seven months, and it was not statistically different for EBV positive or negative um, PTLD. This could be because many EBV PTLD we diagnosed were already as monomorphic um, PTLD. Okay, great. Um, and uh, uh, there's a question uh, that uh, I'll just uh, summarize for you. Uh, and it speaks to, um, uh, as Dr. Vikas Dardanakar indicated, if I understood your data and analysis correctly, rituximab effect of preventing PTLD was greater with more survival after transplant. How do you explain the mechanism? <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting question. And I think this is not yet very clearly known because we do not really understand the effect of rituximab on PTLD prevention. What is known is that the effect of rituximab is, is very long or can be quite long detected. So the terminal half-life of rituximab is several weeks and B-cell nadir, at least in the rheumatologic literature, is described at four months. And if you look at when these patients, um, when their peripheral B-cells return, it's in after two years, there is not even half of them have normal numbers. So I could imagine that probably this, this effect on, on, on the B cell, B cell, um, on the B cell probability to expand could could be um, could be the cause of this effect. Did you look at the effect of uh, induction using alemtuzumab? Um, we do have very few. We did not have alemtuzumab induction in our cohort. Okay. We didn't look at it. And and also, uh, have you seen PTLD limited to the kidney allograph in kidney transplant patients? No, we have not seen. We have only seen lungs and livers. Okay. But it has been described. Right. The literature. Right. right. Um, did, uh, did you inform the uh, recipients before transplantation uh, about an EBV positive donor uh, if the recipient was negative? No, this is usually not done in Switzerland. We do okay. not right. um, tell them. Okay. And uh, at our center, we, we have seen um, increased survival with, uh, with PTLD um, that is confined to nodes versus extra nodal sites. Can you um, tell us what your experience has been? Can you repeat the question, sorry? So, so PTLD that is confined to, to lymph nodes versus other sites, a uh, better survival when it's just involved in the nodes. What, what has been your experience? In this data, we, if we looked at it, we did not find a difference, but it's, it's very, there are very few cases around these 60 cases. And 
I think what is interesting is that in the general population, it is also associated with high, with higher um, mortality rates if it's extranodal. But in, in our mixed population, we didn't see that. Okay, all right. Now, uh, what about the uh, effect of CNA, CMV DNA email? Um, was that included as a variable in the multivariable analysis? CMV DNA, DNA, DNA email, not EBV. CMV. Okay. Yeah. Um, we looked at infection rates, and these were similar, but we didn't correct for for CMV DNA. I think this is a what is a quite complex topic. If it is really an independent risk factor for PTLD, and um, would have would have uh, needed, um, I think, um, a, a larger. Um, a higher rate of, of um, um, PTLD to answer this question. Right, right. Um, and, and now, um, tell me, just, just, um, just so we're clear, uh, just review again for us the, the, the rituximab uh, protocol um, in terms of the timing of administration and number of doses. It's usually, as here in Bern, it's usually done once and it's the 375 milligrams per square meter. Um, it's given four weeks before ABO um, um, incompatible kidney transplantation. Right, right. Um, and in terms of the, uh, let's talk a bit about the consequences uh, of using rituximab, you alluded to potential uh, adverse events, but, but can you comment on uh, whether or not any of your patients had a, uh, a recurrence of uh, PTLD uh, after um, at a much later stage or not necessarily recurrence, but the occurrence of PTLD at a much later stage after um, transplant uh, and and second, uh, whether or not um, you did if, if those cases of cases of PTLD occurred, uh, were they uh, 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 CD20 negative or not? Um, I think we had only few with, with recurrence. I think it's only two and three, and I'm I'm not sure if they had if about their CD20 status. I know that there are concerns. Um, if you give um, rituximab, that you will have more P, um, CD20 negative PTLD. Yes, and that's what I what I'm alluding to. So it's something that we need to um, to uh, watch very carefully. Now, there's a question about um, uh, ABO incompatibility. So, can you how can you separate ABO incompatibility from rituximab use in this study? Um, these may be collinear variables. How would you propose moving beyond this issue? Yeah, that's true. We, since 88% of these um, most kidney recipients re, um, were ABO um, incompatible kidney um, transplant recipients, we cannot definitely um, allude it to, to um, this. I think. But from a mechanistical point of view, I would, you could, I wouldn't argue that immunoabsorption is really, um, has a preventive effect, but in the end, it's true. We cannot definitively um, exclude it. We would have to need a, we have, would have to have a higher, a, a larger a cohort where rituximab was used as induction treatment um, to look at this uh, independent of ABO um, incompatible kidney um, transplantation. As and what about, what about plasmapheresis um, and uh, hypogammaglobulinemia? Or are they, were these factored into the analysis? 
No, hypoglobulinemia is not captured by the STCS, so we do not know um, the effects of it. We don't, we don't know the, how long the effect um, lasts in these uh, recipients. Okay. So, so moving forward, um, obviously there are, there are limitations with um, uh, the study design as you have alluded to, um, but, but that notwithstanding, uh, if you were to uh, use rituximab, in an attempt to reduce the risk of uh, PTLD, what would any any conclusions with respect to the timing? Uh, do you do will you stick with um, giving it prior to um, transplantation or at transplantation or just after transplantation? What do you what do you think? Well, since I'm an ID physician, this is probably a difficult question for me to respond. Um, I think I would. I think there is this study where it has been used in kidney and transplant recipients, where it, where they gave it directly as at transplantation. So I could imagine to to give it then, but of course our data is not enough to support the use only for this indication. I think there has to be other. Um, cohorts um, um, who have to confirm our results. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and um, tell us a little bit again. Just summarize for us your um, overall impression with respect to antiviral agents. I think. We, we probably had, did not have enough um, transplant recipients to, re, to really also see the differences for, for CMV and HSV um, active agents. I think what we can conclude that it probably doesn't have a, any, any very huge effect. So probably you could see something if you have, would have an, a lot of patients, but uh, PTLD uh, incidence, at least in, in the adult population, is, is uh, thought to go down because of the adaptation of induction treatment over the last 20 to 30 years. So I'm not very sure if we will ever really see a study that, that, see, that shows it, something else than, it, than that we did not, do not find this effect. So I think if there is an effect, it's a very it's a small effect, and it's probably not enough in, to to argue for um, antiviral prophylaxis in, in such a patient alone. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a point taken. So you know, there are whenever you give a presentation on EBV and PTLD, there are a number of um, questions that will always um, pop up if, if you have enough time. And so one of these um, relates to um, uh, prophylaxis, um, uh, in, including the use of antiviral agents. So for your patients who are EBV donor positive, recipient negative, um, and who do not have risk for CMV, at least do not have a high risk for CMV or intermediate, so they are D negative or negative for CMV. Uh, would you provide prophylaxis directed at the EBV D positive or negative uh, scenarios? No, I think we, we see a lot of negative effects also of CMV prophylaxis. So I would rather stick with a frequent control and then, and then an action in, in case of ill elevated EBV D anemia than than on um, than on these antivirals, but of course there there are different uh, ideas here. Yeah, no, it's you're, you're right. It's um, an area that is still steeped in controversy. This, um, well, let, okay. So in your setting, then um, EBV donor positive recipient negative, no CMV risk, i.e. CMV D negative or negative. You just do. Um, uh, EBV viral load monitoring, uh, and um, presumably do that every one to two weeks. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 
So the virus load gets, um, becomes elevated. Uh, what do you do? Yeah, this is a very difficult question, I think. Um, there, there is not a lot of data, interestingly, yet in this setting. In HSCT um, recipients, as I, as I said before, there is, they, they, there they give a lot of rituximab for this indication. But I think I would try to reduce immunosuppression as, as low as possible and see what happens. And if it doesn't go down, I would consider to give rituximab. Um, for this page to this patient. So you would uh, is that is that your um, uh, you're you're just um, thinking of that as an opinion or is that practice at your center? <laughs> I think it's 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 um, more my, it's my opinion because we do not see these patients a lot in the adult population since uh, we have more than ninety five percent of them. Um, and people positive with positive uh, with um, recipient positive for EBV. So I think it's not a question that we are very often um, confronted with. But this is what we do when we have such a case. We try to reduce immunosuppression and then um, and then think of giving rituximab. Yeah, I do concur with the cutting back on immunosuppression. The rituximab uh, is a bit more um, uh, controversial. Um, well, let's say you um, uh, reduce immunosuppression uh, and your uh, virus load becomes elevated and um, remains elevated and it goes weeks and months even and the virus load uh, remains elevated. Uh, what what do you do? I think it also depends on on. I think we we would for, of course need some diagnostics at at some point to see if you will find um, more than only EBV replication, but if you find some localized PTLD in some organ, probably using PET or PET CT or something similar, and then do histology to because in the end you, you will have to treat it differently in case you find them all, you find already um, um, monomorphic PTLD. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, a comment has been made um, relating to um, ABO incompatible um, uh, in the setting of a, you know, rituximab uh, with respect to the um, uh, data you presented and it said, a uh, comment says that in the case of a pediatric ABO incompatible heart recipients less than two years of age without rituximab induction, there's no difference in PTLD occurrence uh, when compared uh, with um, uh, individuals who are um, uh, in terms of numbers, um, less than 400 ABO incompatible uh, recipients versus uh, just less than 2,000 um, avion compatible patients. And that was a comment made by um, Simon Urschel. Okay. Now, um, someone mentioned that they might have missed it, but did you show EBV loads over time in your patients? And stating that it would be interesting to see the temporal nature of this in the setting that you presented. Yeah, um, due to the lack of standardized time points for monitoring EBV, the anemia and different modalities of testing inside the SDCS, um, we did not include this data. I think it would be of interest, but it's usually done because of high risk patients or suspected um, PTLD so we didn't we didn't include this in the in in our in our um, in, in our um, project. Right. Yes. No. Another say you 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 didn't have many um, children. It's less than uh, I think um, five percent um, were were children. Is that right? Yes. So they mostly. Um, so it's hard to draw any conclusions. Um, as far as the kids are concerned. Of course, yes. 
Yeah, but uh, again, just, just speaking more generally to the uh, data that you have, um, the numbers aren't great, um, but you have among the 57 patients um, with PTLD, tell us a little bit more about um, uh, their outcomes. And, and and were you able to um, uh, uh, make any comments about um, uh, uh, locations of PTLD? I alluded to this earlier, but let's go a little bit further with that. For example, CNS PTLD um, versus extra CNS PTLD. Yeah, yeah. As as also in non transplant um, non transplanted patients, CNS P CNS lymphoma as CNS PTLD is in the end has a, a much higher rate. I think of our patients, um, I, I don't remember the exact um, number now, but um, of, of this, um, I think it's something about seven or eight with CNS. Um, I think all of them died over time. So the mortality is very high, unfortunately. Okay, okay, all right. And and um, and there's nothing, I mean, you, you, you probably would have stated this if you had it, but um, there is no uh, nothing to suggest a different type of um, uh, pathology in uh, patients receiving rituximab. I didn't. Can you repeat the question? Uh, is in terms of the uh, CNS PTLD, was there anything unusual, anything different in terms of? Um, the uh, nature of their um, uh, PTLD uh, in terms of histopathology in the setting where they had received rituximab? Not, not then that I am aware of. Most as most of our um, PTLDs were were, dif were classified as diffuse large B cell um, lymphoma, and also in the CNS. Okay, great. So we're winding down now. And so um, uh, perhaps um, it's an opportunity to uh, provide you uh, with um, a couple of minutes to uh, give us um, a uh, summary, big picture summary of your data and anything um, else you want to add to round things off. So, I think what, what we have, have seen is that not only in the HSCT um, population, but probably also in solid organ transplant recipients, there, could, there is an effect on, of rituximab also um, given earlier than or given at transplantation on PTLD occurrence um, thereafter. I think this is what we can, can conclude. And we, we didn't see any, any effect of antiviral um, prophylaxis. Wonderful. Well, with that, uh, if there are no uh, further questions, uh, we will bring the session to its end. Thank, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, doctor. Thank you. AST would like to thank doctors Valti and Allen and all of our attendees for today's session. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey and visit myast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for upcoming AST AJT journal clubs. To learn more about the AST infectious disease community of practice, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the IDCOP hub. Thank you all for today's session.